actual activity of business creates value, positive value in the world. Not for what it might do afterwards, not by giving away to charity, and there's nothing wrong with giving to charity, but not in trying to atone for it later. The actual activity of business itself has to be valuable in itself, otherwise we shouldn't do it. Welcome to the Acton Vault Podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. For this episode, we're taking you back to Acton University 2022. There is no shortage of headlines pointing to another powerful corporation run amok or the consumer base being manipulated. These types of issues have cast a significant shadow on the legitimacy and purpose of business even the possibility of a good or moral business. This lecture from James Otteson aims to present how a renewed vision of the interconnectedness of morality and prosperity is key to building and sustaining a properly functioning society. Honorable and life-giving business may actually be integral to creating social institutions that produce meaningful value. James Otteson is professor of business ethics at Mendoza College of Business at the University of Notre Dame. He earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from the Program of Liberal Studies at the University of Notre Dame in 1990. Otteson lectures widely on Adam Smith, classical liberalism, political economy, business ethics, and related issues, including for the Fund for American Studies, the Adam Smith Society, the Acton Institute, the Institute for Humane Studies, and the Tikva Fund. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and by leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Vault is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. So my name is Jim Otteson. I teach at the University of Notre Dame. Um, I teach in the business school at Notre Dame. Um, I was an undergraduate there, and um, I went, did not study business as an undergraduate. Um, after leaving Notre Dame, I went and got a PhD in philosophy at the University of Chicago. Spent most of my career at other institutes, well, all of my career at other institutions. Returned to Notre Dame as a professor just two years ago. So I just finished my second year at Notre Dame. Um, that's all right. Maybe that's God calling, saying, <laughs> get going. Um, speaking of God, one of the things I can do now uh, at the University of Notre Dame that I have never been able to do in my career until now is I pray before my classes. Never done that before. Um, So I pray now before my classes. In any case, uh, so I teach in a business school. um, And as a philosopher, there are not many philosophers in business schools, as you might guess. Um, There are very few of us. Um, We basically know who all of each other is. There's just a few of us. Um, But we're hoping to increase our numbers eventually. But... um, One of the things, so I was asked to teach a business ethics course um, at my prior institution before coming to Notre Dame, a business ethics course. Just about every business school has these courses called business ethics. um, And in most places, um, they have a lot of similarities, namely, no, but none of the students don't like them and the faculty don't like to teach them. Um, Oftentimes, people don't really understand why they're there. Um, And I thought this was a little odd. And so before I taught my first business ethics course, I decided to do a bit of a survey of syllabi. So I looked at what other people who were teaching these courses taught. And a couple of things I discovered were there's basically no consensus about what such a course should teach, what material is required or uh, essential or not essential, what the goals of a course like that are. Um, Very wide range of all kinds of different things. Um, which I thought was strange and odd for a discipline that considers itself a discipline. Business ethics is a discipline, but there doesn't se- didn't seem to be much consensus about these courses. Um, but I also noticed one other thing, and this really did strike me as strange. Many of the students who were studying business, the undergraduate students who were business majors in various disciplines, finance, marketing, accounting, whatever they were, they had, you know, if they had to take a business ethics course, what I discovered was that many of them were embarrassed by the fact that they were studying business. They didn't want people to know, including their their peers, their friends in college, to know they were studying business. Now, just think about that for a second. That strikes me as a very strange thing. If you're studying something, thinking about dedicating your life to something, but you don't want people to know, that seems like a red flag. That seems like something we should pay attention to, maybe take a look at. 
And I found it to be especially true for people who are finance majors. So finance students especially didn't want anybody to know they were studying finance. They would tell their friends they're studying psychology or something, you know, because I guess that sounded less threatening. Okay. So here's my thought about this. When I was thinking about business and business ethics classes, if we're going to have a discipline called business and we're going to have schools of business and we're going to teach people to the technical skills they need to know about business, then there really ought to be some way of describing what they're doing such that you don't have to be embarrassed about it. Okay, so that's what I want to talk about today um, is the ideas I came up with after teaching business ethics several times. Um, and I wanted to suggest, and I've told my students, and I would offer this for your consideration, that maybe there's something we might call honorable business. But even using that phrase, honorable business, a lot of people get you know, very nervous about that phrase. So when I tell colleagues, especially in philosophy, I said my discipline is philosophy. I teach business ethics. You know, they say, oh, you know, it must be a short class, or um, you know, it's an oxymoron, you know, all these jokes that you hear. You hear the same thing about honorable business. What could that possibly be? Some type of, some type of contradiction in terms. And one reason I think students have the reaction, the defensiveness that they have, business students, why they're defensive about it is because they know what the wider culture thinks about business. So these are just some headlines, some fairly recent headlines I've taken. I'm just showing them to you. The two on the left from the, come from the Chronicle of Higher Education, which is you know, arguably the leading newspaper of uh, higher education. Business schools have no business in the university. This one below, abolish the business major. And take a look what it says. I don't know if you can quite read it. Anti-intellectual degree programs have no, places, no place in colleges. Anti-intellectual programs, OK. <laughs> yeah, let me say something about that in a second. Um, and then on the right there, um, this is a book that came out from Cornell University Press in 2019. Nothing succeeds like failure, the sad history of American business schools. OK, um, so maybe um, connected with the point I think you were implying. You might guess none of the people who wrote those articles or the, those two articles or that book, um, they aren't business professors. They weren't business students. They're humanities professors. In all three, cases, these, in all three of these particular cases, they're hi history professors. Um, but I think this is a fairly pervasive view. You get in a lot of places outside of business. So I think it's fair to say they probably don't have a lot of intimate, you know, inside uh, knowledge of the way business schools uh, operate. So that's fair enough. Nevertheless, these are typical. This view about business and business school, is, business schooling is quite typical. It's quite common. And I think this is part of what students um, take in. And I have to show you just one more. And I apologize for how small this is. Don't worry about trying to read it. Um, this is a paper that came out a couple years ago that's actually encapsulating seven different studies of um, a people's opinions about business. And what did they find? And the, the highlighted portion there is, in seven studies, we show that people see business profit as necessarily in conflict with the social good. Did you all catch that? Not it's sometimes in conflict with the social good, or it might possibly be. It's necessarily, profit is necessarily in conflict with the social good. Yeah. This is a very common view. It's a very strong view. And I suggest that this has a lot to do with the overall view that students, that business students are nervous and they're defensive and they're a little bit, um, you know, they, they don't like to talk about, a little bit embarrassed about why they study what they're studying, about what they're studying. And I think it's partly because they have this, they know what the wider culture thinks about it. And, you know, just think for a second. Who's the villain in most Hollywood movies? Well, it is often the CEO of some multinational corporation who's doing bad things behind the scenes that other people don't know about. You know, and you need some people who are going to figure this out. And yeah, that's a very common view. And I think this is part of the view that students imbibe. So when we talk about whether there can be such a thing as moral purpose of business, so I thought what might be useful in teaching a course on business ethics is not necessarily to start out with, well, what is utilitarian ethics and what is deontological ethics, so different theories of ethics or meta-ethics. But instead, ask this question. Can there be a moral purpose in business? If you want to be a moral person, if you want to lead a life that you can be proud of as a virtuous person, is there some way to do that while participating in business? In other words, it's such a way that you're not being virtuous in the evenings and on the weekends, but integrated throughout everything you do in your life. That's the question I want to ask. And if so, what is it? How could we do that? Could business be part of that? Okay, so here's the question I ask my students. 
Um, why would you want to study business? And usually when I ask them that, this is the total universe of possible responses that they think of, either to get a job or to make money. And business students themselves are asked, why are you studying business? By their friends who are studying you know, other things. And the assumption is that these are the only two possible reasons you could want to study business. Now, is it true that business students want to get a job and make money? I assume it's true. You don't think it's true? I'm sh I assume it is true they would like to get a job and make money. Is that true for every student at a university? Yes, I'm sure it is. OK, so I don't think that distinguishes business students by itself. Still, let's take the hard case. Let's actually address the, the implied criticism. If that's the only reason you would go into studying business, indeed, if that's the only reason you're going to do anything is to make money, I think that's not a particularly inspiring reason. In fact, if the only reason you this is a little bit of a vuncular advice I give my students. If the only reason you're thinking about doing something is because somebody's going to pay you for it, that might be a red flag, too. You know, maybe that's something you should reconsider. If that's the only reason, is there some other reason I would do it? OK, so let's consider these two professions. Let's compare these two. So think about medicine and business. So first of all, they are both professions. In both cases, there are specialties, subspecialties. In both cases, you need technical knowledge to succeed. To do well, you need some technical knowledge. In both cases, you probably need a lot of experience also before you're ever going to be successful. And in both cases, if you are successful, you might make a lot of money. OK, so in all of those ways, they're similar. But think how differently the wider culture views those two professions. Specifically, I'll be specific and provocative, I hope. Nobody says to the medical professional, to the surgeon, nobody says to the surgeon, well, now that you've made your money, you need to give back to society. OK, so, but think, have you all heard that phrase, give back? They do ask that of the business person. Business professional, businesses, you need to give back. Have you ever thought about that phrase? Notice what people don't say is you need to give you need to give back. That's an important difference, isn't it? When you were a child and your mother said to you, you need to give that back, what does that mean you did? Yeah, you took something. You did something wrong that you now need to atone for. You need to make up for something bad that you did. So when people say that to business people or businesses, that you, they need to give back to society, is that because they think that if you're successful in business, you must have done something bad somewhere along the way, even if we don't know what it is. You need to atone for it and make up for it. I think the answer is yes, that is exactly what people think. That is exactly what people think about successful businesses, business people. If you're successful, you must have done something wrong. You need to atone for it like a sin. You need to give back to society. That's why they think that. OK, so here's my suggestion and my first argument I want to make for you for your consideration. Here's what I would say. Suppose we, you know, as if we were a class and we look at all of the arguments in favor of a market economy, all the arguments in favor of business in a market economy, and then we also look at all the objections and worries and concerns that people have. Suppose we've done all of that. We review that dispassionately, and at the end of it, we come to the conclusion, or you come to the conclusion, that, yeah, you know, business really is the sort of activity that you need to make up for afterwards. It, is the, it really is the kind of thing where you're, you're going to have done something wrong. You're going to need to make up for it. You're going to need to give back afterwards. Okay, here's my, my argument. If that's the conclusion we come to, then we should not ask business people or business students to give back to society. That's the wrong thing. What should we do instead? Huh. I would say even something expropriated is what he said. <laughs> Powered the people. All right. I would say something different. I would say, don't go into business in the first place. You shouldn't do it in the first place. Well, so think about other sins. What do you say to the thief? You don't, you don't say to the thief, well, it's fine as long as some of what you steal you give to charity. You say, you say stop stealing. You don't say to the murderer, well, it's OK as long as most of the people you kill are bad. Stop killing. You don't say to the adulterer, you know, et cetera. You can go down the other sins. What we say is don't do it in the first place. So I think we should have the courage of our convictions. If we really think that business is an inherently suspicious activity, such that you cannot conduct it honorably, 
that if you're successful, you will have done something wrong, then I should say, then I say we shouldn't encourage people to do it in the first place. We should, certainly shouldn't have schools that teach you how to be really, we don't have schools that teach you how to be really good thieves. That would be bad. <laughs> That's where they go. So I would say, if business really is the sort of thing that we need to atone for, if there's no way of conducting business such that it's valuable in itself, we shouldn't engage in business. And so what's the alternative there? Business should be valuable in itself. If, to turn that around, if we're going to engage in business, if we're going to have professors who teach business or business ethics, we're going to have business schools, then, and if we're going to encourage people to dedicate their lives to business, then there better be some way of describing it such that it's valuable in itself. The actual activity of business creates value, positive value in the world. Not for what it might do afterwards, not by giving away to charity, and there's nothing wrong with giving to charity, but not in trying to atone for it later. The actual activity of business itself has to be valuable in itself, otherwise we shouldn't do it. Okay, so that brings me to this question. Why should we engage, teach, have business? Why should we have it? And indeed, the course that I teach at uh, Notre Dame, I don't teach a course. It's not called Business Ethics or Introduction to Business Ethics. It's called Why Business. That's the title of it. <clears throat> so here's my little answer. What I'd like to give you for just a, you know, the next few minutes we have together, I just want to sketch for you the answer that I have for this, my, my own answer. So I start with Aristotle. I mentioned that I was a philosopher by training, so I hope you'll allow me to talk about Aristotle, but don't worry, just for a minute or two. It won't be too painful. Um, According to Aristotle, human beings have, maybe uniquely among creatures on Earth, a hierarchy of ends or hierarchy of purposes. All that means is that there are things that we want to accomplish today that are in the service of our medium-term goals, which themselves are in service of longer-term goals, and so on, until we get to what Aristotle said is our ultimate purpose, our ultimate goal, our ultimate aim, uh, aim which is the final thing for the sake of which everything else we do is in the service. Okay? So we have a hierarchy of purposes. All right, now, for human beings, what actually is this ultimate end? According to Aristotle, it's this word called eudaimonia. That's just a transliteration of the Greek word, eudaimonia. Maybe some of you have heard that word before. It's a bit hard to translate into English. It's often translated as happiness, um, which is okay, but you've got to be careful about that in English because happiness in English can mean a lot of different things. It can mean contentment. It can mean pleasure. That's not quite what Aristotle has in mind. Um, Aquinas' phrase, uh, ordered happiness, gives you a little bit more of the flavor. But I would say something like this. Eudaimonia, on Aristotle's view, is something like cognizance of a life well and fully lived. Well and fully lived. A flourishing life. So here's how you might think about this. Here's a little heuristic device you might use. I give it to my students. I give it to you, and you can use it if it's of value to you. I call it the view from 120. The view from 120. What I mean by that is imagine yourself at the end of your life. You're 120 years old. You're looking back on the life you led. What life would you like to have led such that at the end of it, you believe that was a life worth having been led? Hmm. Okay, now that's a hard question. It's a heavy question. Um, but if you think about that, try to imagine what kind of a life you think would give you that favorable end of life judgment, okay? Then when you have some conception of what that would be, then what do you do? You just reverse engineer. What do I need to be doing 20 years from now for that to be, to give me, put me in a good position to achieve that life? 10 years from now, five years from now, today. What do I need to be doing today to give me a chance at accomplishing that life such that at the end of it, I would say that was a life worth having been led? That's the sort of idea, I think, that Aristotle has in mind. Now, we change our minds about this over time. We have more experiences. We grow up and we mature. Yes, that's true. And all that means is that we need to keep doing it. We need to regularly engage and think whether the things we're doing today are actually setting us up on a um, uh, with good chances to achieve this ultimate end. So to achieve eudaimonia, then, we have to rationally order our life. It means the things we do today have to actually increase the chances of they serve the goals of a month and a year and five years, which themselves will, in fact, serve the goal, ultimately, of eudaimonia. And if we're doing stuff now that's taking us away from that, then we're leading an irrationally ordered moral life. Okay. 
All right, so far so good. All right, now, what does this have to do with business? All right, well, what I'm going to suggest is something similar, a kind of hierarchy of purpose. So I'm going to give you what I think is the proper context of business in only five steps. Very easy and simple. I think the first two steps are not particularly controversial, but I'll get controversial by the third step. Here's the first step. Wherever you are, wherever we are on the political and economic spectrum, I think we all want a just and humane society. We want a society whose institutions are just, in other words, reflect justice, and in which the people, the citizens of the society, are treated humanely. Okay? It's a fairly, it's a high level. I'm not giving you a specific, maybe you're worried about, we have different definitions of justice and um, what it means to have a just and humane society. Fair enough. Give me a second, I'll get a little more specific. That's the highest level. Number two, a just and humane society depends on various social institutions, a variety of institutions. Now, that's going to be maybe political institutions, economic institutions, cultural institutions, if culture is an institution, religious institutions, etc. So there's a variety of institutions that are required to uphold a just and humane society. Okay, so far so good. I don't think that's too controversial yet. I'm going to get controversial now. Um, among those institutions, not the only one, but among them, is a properly functioning market economy. So it is one of the institutions that's required for a just and humane society, not the only one. There are others that are required too. Okay, now, you're all budding philosophers, I know. Um, so if you read that sentence, even if you're willing to entertain the possibility, if you read number three there, what's the word you want me to know, uh, want me to define? What's the word that's doing a lot of work in that sentence? Properly, thank you. What is properly? Okay, all right. Thank you. Here's number four. Well, only five, so. A properly functioning market economy is based upon honorable business. Ta-da, okay. Now what do you want to know? What's honorable? Thank you very much. What's honorable? Here's my answer. Honorable business is industries, firms, you, individuals, creating genuine value. What I mean by that is improving your own life only by improving the lives of others. Never, that's actually two pieces. That's a little bit more substantive than you might initially think. On the one hand, it means never improving your life at the expense of somebody else. Never, even when you can get away with it, even when nobody would know. And improving your life only by creating genuine value for somebody else, meaning value that you believe actually improves another person's life. Because there may be plenty of cases where you think, yeah, we could have a, a mutually voluntary transaction here, but I don't think this is actually good for me or you or our souls or society. So it has to be something you genuinely believe will improve, will create genuine value. And so then the idea here is that business people can create, who are creating value like this can create to this hierarchy of purpose. And if you're doing it right, here's our little in-class quiz. Are you ready? If you're doing this right, there's one way and one way only that you can improve your own life. And that is what? Improving other people's lives. Only way to do it. Okay. Uh, this is just to show you that I can use PowerPoint. Um, it's exactly so Thank you very much. One thing I had to learn in uh, teaching at business schools is how to use PowerPoint. I didn't use PowerPoint as a philosopher. but Yeah, so this is just to show you that these things are connected. But I would say... I would consider it a victory. I personally would consider it a victory if somebody who came out of you know, our business school at Notre Dame and has a job wherever they're going. They're going to work um, at Deloitte or they're going to work at EY or wherever they're going to work. They're going to work for FedEx or whatever they're going to work for, some company they're going to work for. If somebody says, well, what are you going to be doing at FedEx? Um, they say, oh, I'm going to be contributing to a just and humane society. And if the person says, well, what, what on earth do you mean by that? They say, well, give me two minutes and I'll explain it to you. And they tell exactly this hierarchy. What I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis is creating genuine value so that I prove my, improve my life only by improving the lives of others, as is um, required by the properly functioning market economy that's part of the institutions that support a just and humane society. Okay, so there you have uh, my sketch of that. Um, now, if you've, if you've ever taught students, you will know what the next question they always ask is, is this going to be on the test? Um, why do we care about this? Why should we care about any of this stuff about you know, purpose and whatever? Um, 
So here's one reason. Have you seen this graph before? I know some of you will have seen this graph. If you have not seen it, um, I encourage you to take a look at it, show it to all your students in every class, no matter what you teach. Um, so what are you looking at there? What you're looking at is the total amount of wealth created in the world um, for the last 2,000 years in real terms. In other words, discounted for inflation and differences in currencies in real terms. Total amount of wealth created in the world over the last 2,000 years, that's uh, quite a remarkable hockey stick. Um, something dramatic happened. You might wonder what exactly happened. Something. Oh, you have an answer? In the Industrial Revolution, a very good guess. Let's come back to that in just a second. I think I have... One more graph, and then we'll talk about that. So this is now going back a little bit further. This is going back to 12,000 years ago, 10,000 BC. The difference here is I'm giving it to you per capita. So this is, again, um, uh, in real terms, total amount of wealth divided by the number of people alive on the planet um, each year for the last 12,000 years. There are two, you can see there are two different uh, lines there. There's the red line from Brad DeLong, who's an economist at uh, Berkeley, right now, California Berkeley, right now. The blue line is from Angus Madison, who, as I've said before, should have won a Nobel Prize for doing this work, figuring out how to calculate this all the way back to year one. He died before he, could have won, before he was able to do this. The differences between the two lines are owing to slightly different ways of calculating, but I think those are less interesting than the consistency. What you have is remarkably consistent, remarkably low, and then something happens. Okay, so what could have happened? So we have one suggestion, the, the Industrial Revolution. Maybe you have other ideas. Hmm. So now you're beginning to think you might have been primed in various ways for what's going to happen. Um, suppose you're a social scientist. You've never looked at anything like this before. You don't know what any of this represents. What's the interesting part of this graph? Well, is it what happened between 5,000 and 4,000 BC? No. 4,000? No. What happened here? Something dramatic happened. Now, what can we rule out? Before we figure out what happened, what did happen, there are some things we can rule out as explaining that. For example, are human beings biologically different today than they were 12,000 years ago? Nothing. No, that's not it. Are they psychologically any different? No. If you took a child from 12,000 years ago and transported that child to... Uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan in 2022, what would that child be doing? Uh, uh, I was going to say pl playing Far Cry 6 or something like everybody else. I don't know, whatever the latest video game is. They'd be doing something indistinguishable from every other kid uh, that they grew up with, so there'd be no difference. So it's not biology, it's not psychology. What about the climate? Did the climate change during this time? So this period, 12,000 years ago, is right as we were coming out of the last great ice age. So in the last 12,000 years, did the earth warm? Did it cool? The answer is yes, both. You had a little bit of warming, you had periods of cooling, it went up and down. No change whatsoever, nothing. Okay, that, rule, that seems to rule out three prime suspects. Not biology, not psychology, not climate. Something else changed. What changed? So maybe you think, well, there's something like the Industrial Revolution. That's what you mentioned. The Industrial Revolution happened. It's hard to tell because I'm collapsing so many years there, so you can't quite see the time frame. It looks like the Industrial Revolution succeeded rather than preceded the change. In other words, something was beginning to happen that led to the Industrial Revolution, which supercharged everything, and then it all took off. And one way to think about this, I'll ask you, uh, give you this question. If you think about if human beings aren't biologically different, they aren't psychologically different, why didn't the Industrial Revolution happen some other time? Why didn't it happen in some other place? I'll give you one example. When was the first functioning steam engine? Anybody know? When did we have the first functioning steam engine? I mean, I'll give you a hint. That's usually connected with when we talk about the Industrial Revolution. It was what really basically spurred the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. Any ideas of the name of who we usually credit with coming up with the first steam engine? James Watt, that's usually the person. Yeah, right at the end of the 18th century. James Watt was a friend of Adam Smith's, by the way. You probably knew that, but they, they knew each other. Um, yeah, so that's where we usually credit it, except that's not true at all. We know that there was a fully functioning steam engine that occurred a little bit earlier than then. In fact, it was in the first century AD in Alexandria. 
there were some engineers who created a functioning steam engine for the emperor to celebrate his birthday. And what it did, was it had exactly what you would imagine. It had some uh, coals and embers that lit up on fire. It had a cauldron of water and burned, the, so the, the heat boiled the water. Water came out, and what did it do? This little thing moved. It was small. It moved and was a whistle, made whistling noises. So they presented it to the emperor, showed him that it worked, and everybody said, oh, that's amazing. Thank you, and they put it on a shelf. That was it. No industrial revolution. Now, why do I bring that up? Because things like that have to be, have, they have to happen in the right kind of situation. I mean, if you think about 1000 AD, where was, I mean, if you had looked, if I transported you back to 1000 AD and look at the world, and I said, there's going to be a place in about 800 years that's going to get really, really rich. What place would you guess if you looked at the world in 1000? Well, I mean, what's your guess? Do you have a guess? Yeah, what did you say? China. Yeah, I would have said China. China first, probably, because that was the Song Dynasty in China. You remember the Song Dynasty? Song Dynasty, huge territory. They had ships that could navigate um, the oceans. They had a literate populace. Um, they knew about agriculture. They had writing. They had gunpowder. They had a lot of stuff that you would think were the ingredients for Industrial Revolution, and yet nothing happened. Nothing happened. Something else had to happen. Maybe Babylon would have been second guess after. But what you wouldn't have guessed is some weird backwater in Northwest Europe. I mean, what was going on in the British Isles in 100, uh, sorry, 1000 AD? I mean, a bunch of savages killing each other. That's basically it. I mean, I'm exaggerating. But it wasn't much more than that. Very small groups of internet who were just you know, traveling around killing each other. So something else is going on. Now, maybe you have, this is just to show you how big it is. The average person in 1800 was no better off than 100,000 BC, as far, as far as we can tell. There was basically no change in human existence for all of that time. And look at it today. What we have today is, in the last 200 years or so, we've gotten a 16-fold real increase in worldwide in wealth and a 55-fold increase, real increase. Not 55%. Let's just make sure... 55 times as high. The average person in the United States today is 55 times as wealthy as the average person uh, in the United States in 1800. So now that brings us back to this question, what caused the change? I would like to give you my quick potential answer. It's a shift in morality. That's what I would like to suggest. Not a shift in institutions, a shift in morality. I think, so a lot of people today will point to changing institutions. My suggestion for you to think about is that institutions don't enforce themselves. They don't come from nowhere. They don't just fall out of the sky like manna from heaven. They are created by human beings, and they're only respected if human beings want to respect them. So human institutions tend to follow changes in human beliefs. Human beliefs change. Institutions tend to change to respond in response to the uh, changing beliefs. So my suggestion is that there was a shift in morality, and I'll illustrate it by this example. Who would like to be my guinea pig? How about you, since you've got a nice um, laptop or whatever that is? An iPad. Suppose I would really like to have that iPad. Um, there are two ways I could get that from him, aren't there? What are the two ways I could get that iPad from him? Okay. I would like the record to show that the first thing you said was take it from him. Okay, so one way is I could steal it from you, right? I could kill you and take it. I could steal it from you when you're not looking. I could defraud you out of it. I could promise to pay you $1,000 or $10,000 next week, and you believe me and give it to me, and I run off to Las Vegas or whatever. So there are all of those ways. Um, we can call all of those ways extraction because, so I call them extraction, because what do, those th what do those ways have in common? First of all, they're not voluntary. You didn't say yes. I didn't ask you your permission. If I stole it from you, I just took it. But what's the other way? Who benefited? Did anybody benefit from that transaction? If I steal your laptop, or sorry, your iPad, who benefits from that? Well, I do. Plus one iPad for me, minus one iPad for you, plus one plus minus one is zero sum. In other words, that's not creating new wealth. That's just moving it from one place to another. Okay? All right, so that's one way I could get it. What's the other way I could get it from? You can buy it. Yeah, I can make you an offer that you're free to accept or decline. 
Suppose I make you an offer, I don't know what it is. Suppose I say I'll give you $500 for it, and suppose you say, okay. I give you the 500, you give me the, the iPad. Now who benefited from that transaction? Did we both benefit from it? Yeah, we did. And we know we had to, right? Because if you didn't think you benefited, Dr. Bob Roller. If Dr. Roller didn't think he benefited from that transaction, what would you have said? Yeah, he would have said no thanks. And as long as his no thanks is respected, <laughs> I can't force him, um, then the fact that he said yes means he thought he benefited from his perspective. Same thing with me. If I didn't think the deal was good, I would have said no thanks and gone somewhere else. So if both of us voluntarily say yes, that means both of us from each of our individual respective uh, perspectives believe that we benefit. So it's mutually voluntary and mutually beneficial. Does that seem obvious to you, mutually beneficial? So ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that is not obvious to the vast majority of people in the world today. And it has not been obvious throughout almost all of human history. How did human people, how did human beings get the wealth they did, historically speaking? Think about the great civilizations of the past. Um, what did they do? As soon as one person or one group got enough power, what did they do? Conquer, enslave, steal, colonize. They take it from other people. So how did the Romans get all the capital they needed to build the Colosseum and the roads and the aqueducts? Well, slavery, conquering, theft, etc. Yeah. Yeah, taxing. Not like voluntary taxing or taxation with representation, but yeah. Yeah. So let's call those two ways that we can get something from somebody else extraction versus cooperation. Extraction versus cooperation. And the difference is one's voluntary and one's involuntary. One benefits one party at the expense of the other, whereas the other one, both parties benefit or all the parties benefit. And my suggestion is that what began to happen is more and more people suddenly, well, suddenly, began to think that maybe the moral way to deal with people was through cooperation rather than extraction. That maybe we can all be better off if we engage in cooperation rather than extraction. If we view other people not as enemies, but as opportunities. And not just an opportunity today, but maybe tomorrow too, and the next day. People began to change their views about this, partly because of a changing moral view. And so I'll ask you, here's my in-class quiz. Uh, quiz. Ready? Two, two questions. Between extraction and cooperation, which one is more moral? Well, wait, that's supposed to be the easy question. <laughs> that's cooperate. Right, let me ask that question one more time. Between extraction and cooperation, which of them is more moral? Cooperation. cooperation. Okay, thank you. Does anybody want to dispute that? Okay. All right, so that's more moral. Now, what's the answer to this question? Which of the two leads to increasing overall net prosperity? By a spectacular stroke of good luck, it's the same one. The same one. That's what I think people began to see. But the second part, leading to increasing prosperity, I think followed on the heels of it being the moral way to treat other people. So here's my suggestion. Honorable business, what I call honorable business, is just cooperative business with just a tad more. So the, now let me explain that now, and then we'll stop so we can have some questions. So what am I calling honorable business? First aspect of honorable business, never engage in extraction, extractive behavior, no matter what, even when you won't get caught, even when the benefit to you is enormous and you think the other person won't miss it or something, never. As a matter of principle that you've incorporated into your character, part of your identity, who you are, never engage in extractive behavior. Think about it like the Hippocratic Oath. Um, I don't know if, they still do, if, if medical doctors still do the Hippocratic Oath. Does everybody know what that is? What is the Hippocratic Oath? What's the first part of it? First, do no harm. Yeah. So whatever else you do, you do not make somebody else worse off against their wishes. That's the first step. Never benefit yourself at another person's unwilling expense. And then second, what follows from that? Cooperative behavior only. Look for ways to engage in behavior that benefits not only yourself but others. How in practice do we do that? Treat all parties with respect for their autonomy and dignity, which means what I, respecting what I call their opt-out option. If you make an offer, proposal, request, demand to somebody. They have the right to say no thanks and walk away. And you must respect that right. 
No matter who they are, what their race, religion, social class is, none of that should matter. That should be true for everybody in your society. If somebody says no thanks, you have to let them go. What if you know that, the, that they're making a mistake? Or if you believe they're making a mistake, still have to respect it. If you know they're making a mistake, still have to respect it. If later on they realize that they made a mistake, still had to respect it. I think that's part of, res of viewing another person as possessed of dignity. You have to respect their choices. It also means honor your promises and commitments even when no one's looking. Avoid opportunities. I'm happy to talk about that a little more in the question and answers. All right, now the third and final part. I said honorable business was cooperative business plus a little bit more. Here's what I mean. I think we're called, and I'm using that word on purpose, we're called to make a positive commitment to figuring out ways to generate positive, genuine value for other people. In other words, here's what I mean by that. Suppose you decide you're just going to sit on the couch in your apartment, play video games, and have people deliver your food to you, not actually do anything, you know, not creating anything, not producing anything, um, but you're not harming anybody. You're not making anybody worse off. You're just not contributing anything positive to society, and not directly anyway. Um, what I would suggest is that might be the minimum that we can expect from you in society. So yeah, don't kill, assault, enslave, et cetera, and cause unwanted injury, harm, et cetera. That, yeah, okay. But you're capable of a lot more than that, aren't you? So I mentioned that I teach at Notre Dame, so I can say this you know, from a theological perspective. Let's suppose that you were created by God in the image and likeness of God. What's one thing, that, among other things, but what's one thing that God is? Creator. Maybe that's a central part of what God is. If you're created in the image and likeness of God, what are you also? A creator. So you were given the gift of life. You were given the, lift of, the gift of some kinds of talents and abilities and skills. That's a unique package that only you have. You were put in a position where only you are, which means there is some genuine value in the world that only you, literally only you in the history of the universe, can provide to the universe you are uniquely situated and positioned to do it, which means I think you do have an obligation in light of those undeserved gifts, which is to be worthy of those gifts, to use them in such a way that you are participating in the way only you can in creating value also for others, and ultimately, I think, anyway, this is my personal perspective, um, in the unfolding of God's providence. You have a role to play. So I think that means we have to make a personal commitment to creating actually actual genuine value in the world. OK. Um, yeah, let's not worry about fairness. We can talk about fairness later. Uh, let's not worry about this either. All right. OK, let me conclude. So here's the conclusion I'm happy to hear. But if you have objections or worries or arguments or something, I'm happy to talk about them. Um, <clears throat> here's the summary of my argument. What I'm calling honorable business is cooperative, not extractive. It's cooperative. And because it's cooperative, it treats people with the dignity that they are due as being created in the image and likeness of God. In other words, you make proposals to people that they are free to say no to. And that's a way of showing them respect. No matter how much more money somebody might have than you, if Elon Musk walks in this room and says, I'll give you a billion dollars to work for me at Twitter, could Elon Musk give you a billion dollars to work at Twitter? Yeah, I suppose. Sure. Um, if you have the right and ability to say no thanks, then even though he has so much more money than me, well, than me, I don't want to presume anything on your behalf. Um, he has so much more money than me. Our agencies are immediately leveled. He cannot make me do anything I don't want to do. All of that wealth then becomes irrelevant as long as we both have our opt-out options respected. OK, so honorable business is cooperative in that way. But what else does it do? It seeks to create, seeks to create, actively looks for ways to create genuine value, and therefore leads to increasing overall prosperity. Remember that long, low red line and the hockey stick shooting up? Like the miracle of compounding interest, the more of those kinds of transactions there are, the more people want to engage in those kinds of transactions. And you have this multiplier effect that takes off. And so if the question is put to us, what? purpose or end, should people engage in business? Remember, that's where I started. Why business? Why, are we, why do we have business schools? Why are we teaching students business? 
Here's my answer. What you should do, you should engage in business to use your time, talent, and treasure, your, your unique signature of time, talent, and treasure to benefit yourself and others simultaneously at the same time. And if you do that right, then I think you can create both prosperity and morality because, remember, that's the proper way to deal with other people is to make them offers, treat them as equal moral agents that they can say yes or no to and you respect their choices. That's the way you can get both prosperity and morality. And so understood, maybe it's that, um, the case that business might even be a moral calling. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Vault, I'm Eric Cohn.